All right, welcome everyone. This is Rain Barrels 101. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Matthew Bertrand. I'm a restoration coordinator with Friends of the Rouge. I'm joined here by my Rain Barrel Stubby, uh, who's gonna be my special guest today. You're here because you wanna find out if a Rain Barrel is right for you. I'm here to share that they are fun and rewarding to add to your life. They'll help cut your water bill, that your plants are gonna love the rainwater. They're gonna help your river and it's gonna help cut your uh, carbon footprint. So first, um, imagine a summer rainstorm comes, you feel trapped, you feel cooped up in your house, you wanna be outside gardening. Well, fast forward, get a rain barrel. And uh, when that rain comes, you're gonna feel at peace with the world. You're gonna know that that rain barrel is filling up and that you're gonna have a supply of wonderful water, uh, free water that you'll be able to use on your plants moving forward. So rain barrels add fun uh, and they feel rewarding, uh, great addition to your gardening practice. Uh, cutting your water bill, uh, this rain barrel here will cut your water bill by about five to 20 bucks a year, unless you're one of those lawn sprinkler people. Uh, I've certainly never done this where I uh, leave my lawn sprinkler on and walk away and forget about it for an hour or two. If you're that kind of person, this rain barrel could save you on the order of hundreds of dollars. Uh, plants love rainwater is the next piece. So there's nitrogen in the air. And as the rain comes down, it picks up that nitrogen. And uh, that is uh, just free fertilizer that's wonderful for your plants. Uh, the rain barrels are going to help your river. Uh, we've got a goal of 6,000 rain barrels by 2025. When we see lots of people in the community using these, that cuts the stormwater pollution that hits the river. Lastly, uh, this rain barrel is going to help cut your carbon footprint pretty significantly, actually. So uh, the biggest energy cost in your community typically is actually the cost to treat water and pump it to your door. Water is heavy. It takes a lot of energy to move that water through the system. As much as half of your community's energy cost goes to moving water. So if you can reduce the water you're using in the summertime with a rain barrel, that's a great way to cut that carbon footprint. So lots of great reasons to use a rain barrel. I'm gonna step you through a few more now as we get into the presentation part of um, this event today. So let's see, share the screen here and let's get the presentation going. Back up to the start. Uh, my name again, Matthew Bertrand. Um, got a master's in landscape architecture, restoration coordinator, and landscape designer here at Friends of the Rouge. This is Rain Barrels 101. I'm going to give you the overview of what you need to know to figure out how to make rain barrels a part of your life. This picture here is showing the five different upcycled colors of rain barrels that Friends of the Rouge is bringing to your community right now through our pre order sales. They are a sliding scale event. We're not trying to make money so much as bring in as many rain barrels as possible towards that 6,000 rain barrel goal. So if you are low income, if you're a member of Friends of the Rouge, you buy a couple barrels, you can get these for as low as $50. Or if you'd like to pay a little bit more, you can. And that's going to help to um, you know, invest in your river to further restore it. And it's going to help your friends and neighbors be a part of this too. So uh, take a look at the end of the uh, event here. I'll share the link on how to get there. But a uh, great opportunity for you to get involved in rain barrels. A little bit about Friends of the Rouge. We're a nonprofit. Um, we were founded in 1986 to restore, protect, and enhance the Rouge River. It's located here in Southeast Michigan, Metro Detroit area. The Rouge is the river that kickstarted the automobile revolution uh, that helped the Allies fight in World War II. Um, and uh, it was one of the most polluted rivers. It's come a long ways and uh, we've got farther to go still, but we invite you to get out and explore the river with us. We take folks out kind of canoeing and kayaking every year. You can get out on the industrial stretch, see the Ford Rouge plant, see uh, natural scenery mixed in with industrial scenery. Great way to get out on your river. And then we also mobilize thousands of volunteers every year to get further involved in restoration, whether it's at your home with something like a rain barrel or a rain garden or in your community as well. So it's a little bit about Friends of the Rouge. All right, I'm gonna give you a case study now of a house that put rain barrels to good use and it might just happen to be my house. Uh, this is my backyard when I moved in a couple of years ago. Uh, every spring, I see a massive lake forming about six inches deep of water, and this is actually not as big as it has gotten. And so I have uh, been working hard the last year, especially a pandemic hobby to um, make this a little bit better. So here is, uh, and I'm a little embarrassed to show this because it's not quite done yet. You can see by the cardboard right there, smothering some lawn, but I, I made some good progress last year. You can see some new rain gardens over here in the area where the water was really pooling right next to my vegetable garden, which is great because I'll get pollinators and uh, insect predators that'll come into that rain garden that are gonna help my vegetable garden. Got a new native plant landscape over here, a future native plant landscape, and that's also gonna be a native plant landscape there. Um, just to show you the before again, there is the flooded scene 
and there is the after, the in-progress solution. And then here are the rain barrels uh, associated with that. So here's that native plant landscape that was in the bottom corner. You can see my three rain barrels I've got here. I've got five total at my house. And uh, you'll note I've got concrete blocks here raising those rain barrels up. I've got three together that are linked together so that I store more water here for that vegetable garden that I showed in the previous picture. So these rain barrels are basically providing me all the water I need for my vegetable garden all summer long. Plus, I need a little bit of city water, though, to water some of the plants um, on which the, the rainwater is not the best to use because I have asphalt tar shingle um, roof here. Uh, so that's one of my rain barrel setups. Here's the next one up front. You can see my lovely daughters, ages two and six, playing with their hula hoops. Um, I've got two on the front of my house. Um, all my three gutter downspouts have rain barrels on them. This one is connected to my rain garden system over here. Um, and so I've got water that goes into the rain barrel, also got water that goes into the rain garden as well. And this rain barrel is uh, positioned nicely closer to many of the other plants in my yard. I planted a good 20 shrubs last year and about a thousand square feet of plants. So having those rain barrels has been a huge cost savings for me. Last one here, here's on the other side of uh, my kitchen, little outcropping there. This rain barrel, I've got a little bit less to water over here. This rain barrel is a little more of a water quality rain barrel. So when you've got water that's coming down right onto your driveway, it then goes straight into your storm drain, straight into the river. So this is the biggest problem area for water for your river. And so on this one, I don't have as much to water here and I want this barrel to empty still. So that way it can still be of help to the river. If the barrel is full all the time, then it's not storing water anymore. It's not helping with rainstorms. So on this one, I've actually got a two-way split on there and I've got a 10 foot hose it just runs right over here. It stays in my landscape and I have it on a slow drip. So it drains in about three days or so. So this rain barrel fills up during a rainstorm and then it slowly drips out. And then every rainstorm, it keeps filling on up. So this is a slightly different approach. Um, I've got on both of these front rain barrels, I forgot to mention um, for the previous one, but I've got wooden pedestals supporting these rain barrels. And I used the um, Fiskars uh, rainwater diverter. We'll talk more about diverters in a little bit on these ones and let me jump back. This one I experimented with the earth-minded diverter and uh, both these diverter systems have been working really well. Diverters are great because whenever these rain barrels fill up then the water just goes right back down my downspouts and where it would have gone originally as well. So diverters are a really great way to uh, make your rain barrels easy to manage. All right, uh, moving on, I'm gonna take you to our website now, the rouge.org slash rain barrels 101 uh, for a little bit more information. Uh, maybe five, 10 more minutes of active content here. And then I'm going to just kick it to the Q&A and we'll spend uh, as much time as you want uh, answering any and all of your questions about rain barrels. So this is on our website and it provides brief summary information for most common questions that I get about rain barrels. And if you don't see an answer, ask me and I'll see if I can update it on here as well. So first, a little intro to some of the rain barrel styles that are out there. I already showed you some of the upcycled barrels that Friends of the Rouge is bringing in. There are also wooden barrels. So if you're looking for something a little more classy, uh, but a little more costly as well, uh, there are great wooden rain barrels. Oftentimes they've been used for uh, wine or for uh, bourbon or other you know, spirits. Key with these kind of rain barrels is you wanna make sure they're designed to store water. Uh, some of these are decorative and don't actually work. So read the fine print on that if you're gonna go the wooden rain barrel route. Uh, then there are also manufactured plastic barrels that are available. Um, and they come in all kinds of shapes and styles and colors, a million options that are out there. The website has links here so you can explore some of the options that are currently available. So this is a great way to go. Uh, we talked a little bit about how much water this might save on your bill. I said five to 20 bucks, maybe 150 bucks or more in the year. And that's based on you know, the average cost of water in your community. Um, it's different everywhere, but from what I've seen, it's about 50 cents per 50 gallons. So not a ton of money each time that barrel fills up, but the barrel's going to fill up you know, 20, 30 times throughout the year, depending on rainfall. And uh, then it depends on how much of that water you're actually using as to how much money you're going to save. But again, if you're the lawn sprinkler kind of person, the person that walks away and forgets about it for a few hours, that sprinkler might put out a thousand gallons of water like that. Whereas if you're using a rain barrel like this to spot water, it's beautiful. You get outside a little more, you give just the amount of water that's needed at each plant. And so you can water maybe the same amount of space where that a thousand gallons went with just the 50 gallons. So you can save a lot of water if you are using lawn sprinklers currently. All right, where to place the rain barrel? I showed you a few examples at my house. I put them at all my downspouts, but you don't have to put them everywhere. Uh, you might put them where it's uh, near where you're gonna use the water. Uh, so if you've got a vegetable garden, 
you've got potted plants or maybe near your door so that that way you can go out and get the water, come in, water your house plants with it, um, or maybe near a lawn area that needs a little bit of water. Um, so that could be a place to put it. Think about putting it where you've got problem to solve. Maybe you've got water pooling near your foundation, You're already gonna be doing something to solve it. Maybe you wanna put a rain barrel in as a part of it, um, but then you wanna be careful to make sure to get the water away from the rain barrel afterwards. All right, um, so that's where to place a rain barrel. Uh, lastly, where it'll look great, where you, you know, if you want to show it off to your community, great, put it out front. If you don't, don't. Um, put it where you're going to be happy with it. Next, how to water with a rain barrel. So uh, hoses are nice and convenient and easy, but the key with a rain barrel is it is gravity fed. There is no pressure, um, like from your, your hose with city water in it. And so what you need to do is make sure that the garden that you're going to water is downhill, so you've got gravity pressure, or you raise the rain barrel up. So whether through a pedestal, um, the kinds that I showed you, the concrete block, you make your own. I've seen some people raise them up eight feet in the air um, so that they really maximize the pressure. And that's gonna help you use a hose effectively to water with your rain barrel. Uh, if you don't wanna do that, or if you can't, if your yard is pretty flat, you can use buckets instead. Uh, I use the bucket method for my uh, 20 or 30 shrubs I planted last year, which is basically I just set out five gallon buckets, turn it on, fill them up. I'd have it going on a couple of my barrels at once and I'd be walking around getting some exercise, enjoying my garden. And I'd take the five gallons uh, to some of my plants, carrying them around, getting some you know bicep lifts going. Uh, and then I'd water my plants. You wanna be gentle though. You don't wanna be like this guy and just dump it on the plants because that can be erosive with the water hitting the garden really hard. So you wanna be gentle pouring the water out if you're doing that. You could pour it into a watering can and then that way you've got um, a nice gentle source of water um, afterwards. So um, those are some great ways. You don't wanna use a soaker hose though. There's typically not enough pressure with a rain barrel to use a soaker hose effectively. All right, how to best help the river. So maybe you're coming at this from the perspective of you really wanna help your river. So I wanna show you, uh, this is not uncommon, right? Where people have their downspouts going onto their driveway apron. This is the worst for the river. This water goes straight into the river. It carries pollution along the way, whether it's uh, you know, oils from your car, metals from your brake dust. Uh, so this is not good if you've got this. If you can redirect that downspout onto your uh, you know, grass or your landscape, that's gonna be best. You wanna get it farther away from than, uh, your house from what this picture is showing. 10 feet is good, so you don't have foundation problems. But if you can also add in, say, a rain barrel or a rain garden, or you can add in a rain barrel and have it overflow to a rain garden, that's, that's really great. That's gonna be one of the best things that you can do. Sizing barrels, uh, next common question. Uh, the reality in Michigan is that a rain barrel is gonna fill up like that. Uh, so for example, quarter inch of rain on a 375 square foot section of roof is gonna fill one of these barrels. Um, and most of the time, your roof area is gonna be bigger that's going into one of these barrels. So you always wanna have a plan for overflow with these. And that's partially why I really like those diverters, downspout diverters, because then the water just goes straight back into your downspout where it would have gone before. And you can, uh, you know, hopefully it's gonna be far enough away or you can do something further to get the water away from your foundation. But so that's gonna be one of the things to be aware of is that these barrels will overflow where they will fill up. So you can do what I did. You can link more together um, using linking hoses. You can link as many as you want, actually. Uh, there's no end to that. Uh, there's just an end of space in your yard or an end of your comfort zone. Um, but uh, yeah, you can, you can get as many as you want. And that's great, especially for vegetable gardens so that you get really all the water you might need. I'm not gonna go through this. We don't have time in Rain Barrels 101 here, but on the website, there is a great eight minute video showing installation tips for a rain barrel with a diverter uh, from one of our partners, a conservation district. Great way to go. And then if you want to explore diverters more, there's a video here, it's a great Australian accent that's gonna step you through um, 10 different diverters that are out there. Lots of different styles. So it's really important to find the one that's gonna work best for your particular situation at your home. All right, we're almost at the end here. There's some other directions for how to do it right. Mosquitoes, let's talk mosquitoes for a sec. This is typically the biggest concern most folks have about rain barrels that communities have about rain barrels as well. Um, so the reality is rain barrels are legal in every Rouge community, pretty much everywhere in Michigan, pretty much everywhere in the United States. Um, rain barrels are legal, but if you do not uh, take care of your barrel properly to exclude mosquitoes, then sometimes rain barrels uh, can be subject to nuisance ordinances. If neighbors are complaining about mosquitoes, then you can get cited that way. Basically, anytime you're creating a nuisance at your home, that can be a problem. So this rain barrel here, this is one of the upcycle barrels we're bringing in. 
tilt it on over. We've got a mosquito screen on top um, that will keep mosquitoes from getting into the water here. Um, not all barrels are sold with this. So if you get a barrel that doesn't have a screen, what you can do is you can think about adding, whoa, I'm gonna drop this thing, decorative rocks on top, like I'm showing in the picture here. If you add a nice uh, double layer of rocks in this uh, lid, the mosquitoes will think it is earth and not water and they will not get through it. So that's a great simple way to keep mosquitoes out. You could also, of course, add a screen. Um, that would be a fine thing to do as well. Rocks are pretty, so it's a nice way to go. Uh, so that's a great thing to do. If you do that, that's pretty much the main area that mosquitoes can get in. So your barrel should be good to go uh, by excluding mosquitoes from the top. What we discourage people from doing is relying on mosquito dunks. Yes, the dunks work, but will you remember to keep adding dunks all season long? The answer to that is no, you are going to forget. You're gonna go on vacation and you're gonna get mosquitoes. So those dunks are really not a good idea. It's best to design the rain barrel, build one yourself. If you're gonna build one yourself, or buy one that is designed to exclude mosquitoes. That's really the only way to go. It's the only way we're gonna to get to 6,000 rain barrels is if the rain barrels we're installing are not creating problems. All right, the last thing I'm gonna talk about here and then I'm gonna kick it to questions. I see it looks like two questions have come in now. Um, I'm gonna, ooh, I didn't, it's gonna be hard for me to check the Facebook Live, but if you're on Facebook Live, I'll try to check in with questions over there too. Um, so start loading those questions up if you've got them, but I'm gonna talk food safety. This is a big concern for folks. I've been talking about vegetable gardens here. Not everyone's gonna be comfortable with this and that's okay. You need to make sure that you are comfortable. And so on our website here, we cite one particular research article that talks about uh, rain barrel water use on garden edibles. And we've summarized it here. Um, so the core is if you've got a wood shake roof, don't do it. It's, it's not good. There's toxic chemicals that come out of those wood shake roofs. Um, so that's not so good. If you've got asphalt shingle roofs, however, it is generally safe to use on food gardens if you follow the right guidelines. And the key is uh, you want to water the soil, not the plants. So uh, if you've got, say, something like carrots or radishes or turnips, root vegetables, those are maybe not so good for rainwater because you can't help but water the part you eat. It's underground, it's in the soil. But if you're watering, say, tomatoes or uh, kale, uh, greens of any kind, uh, watermelons, anything that's growing on the surface uh, that, uh, you know, that, such that you can you know, water the ground near it, but not water the part you're eating, that is, um, uh, should be safe. That is generally considered to be safe. Um, if you are worried about things like bird poop or like the dust that's on your roof, um, you know, even if you've got something like a metal roof, which is totally safe, there's still gonna be bird poop and dust. So uh, if you wanted to, if you're gonna be like dedicating yourself to using rainwater for your food garden, you might think about installing something called a first flush system. And uh, it's gonna be beyond rain garden or rain barrels 101 to talk about here, but we do have a link uh, where you can see a bunch of different first flush systems. Um, and there are some you can just buy and install. They're also very easy to make uh, if you know how to cut and uh, connect PVC pipes together. It's not a hard thing to do. And uh, it's great, once you do it, then it's gonna keep out the bird poop from your water for the future. Um, so with that, that's about the end of my Rain Barrels 101 here. So I'm gonna check on the Q&A and uh, I will uh, start stepping through those. And I am, oh, oh gosh, I almost forgot. I always forget, I always forget. I wanted to get back here. Um, to just give you my thanks. Uh, I'm gonna give you some of uh, the follow-up ending information here before I start getting into the Q&A. So you've got my contact information over here if you've got questions and then uh, door prizes, right? I forgot to mention this at the start, but we do have a door prize associated with the event today. So if you go to the rouge.org slash eval, um, that's an evaluation, workshop evaluation. Uh, let us know what you think on there. And then at the end of the evaluation, there's gonna be a link to a place where you can toss your name in the hat for the drawing for a, a, the door prize for one of these upcycled rain barrels here. And then if you like what you've heard today, and you're interested in learning more about water management, we also have an upcoming Earth Day Rain Gardens 101 event at the rouge.org slash rain gardens, or I'm sorry, RG 101. That'll get you there. Uh, so if you like what you've heard here, I'll be uh, talking more about rain gardens in a brief lunch and learn style format coming up um, on Earth Day this year in late April. All right, now with that, I'm gonna get to the Q&A. So let's see, uh, I see Mark McKelvey, was asked, uh, he says, thanks for the informative webinar. Is the rainwater runoff from a standard asphalt room uh, safe to use for filling a hot tub or an inflatable kid's pool? 
Um, let's see, that is a very good question. And I will say I have not seen anyone ask that question in any research articles, I'm guessing because it's not a common usage, right? So most of those articles have focused on food gardens. And so anything I might say about that is gonna be an extrapolation from those articles. And so especially I'd like to encourage you to take a look at those articles and, and think it through yourself as to whether you're gonna be comfortable with it. Um, especially I'm thinking about my daughters uh, who very much like playing with my rain barrels. And uh, especially we had a lot of fun with the, the one that drains out. Um, they love to just, we just turn it on and let the water just run down the driveway, um, which wasn't as entirely good for uh, uh, the river itself. The water did end up making it into the river system, but they love splashing in it. So that's a, an example of something that I thought was pretty safe for the girls and that they're just splashing in it in their feet. It's not that much different from standard rainwater um, that they'd be splashing with uh, in a, a rainstorm. Um, an inflatable kids pool could be a little different though in that kids are going to be drinking that water. They, they're just going to get it in their mouths. They do that. And so I'd be a little bit less comfortable with an inflatable kids pool. Um, think about a hot tub. It's just adults that are going to be in there. It might be okay, especially if you're going to be adding in the typical kinds of um, disinfectant chemicals um, that are going to be going in there. There, I'd be a little bit less concerned about the water. But I just, I'd take a look and see what the water's looking like, right? If it um, has been you know, sitting there stagnant. If you haven't been emptying the rain barrel, if it's just been sitting there for a month or two, the water's not gonna be as nice. So that's uh, another reason to try to keep emptying your rain barrel. But if you are using the water up regularly, um, cycling in and out, um, the water looked pretty clean um, when I was using it all last summertime. And so if you, it would be, I think, clean looking water going in. And if you were adding chemicals, I think it would probably be okay. Um, so that I think is a, an answer to that one. Maybe folks will follow up. Uh, JP Barna asks, I've heard suggestions to only use food grade barrels when the water will be used on your vegetable garden. Is this a valid restriction when the water will be used on food producing plants? I, I think that's generally a good idea. Um, anytime you're doing anything with um, anything food related, anything you're going to be eating, uh, food grade is a good way to go to reduce the chemicals that are going in. I haven't seen any research articles on non-food grade plastics in relation to whether or not the soil microbes or the plants would filter out that pollution uh, or the, the chemicals that would be uh, coming out of a non-food grade piece of plastic. But the reality is that rain barrels are very affordable. Um, the ones that we've got here, like this one right here, Stubby, uh, they are HDPE food grade. It's not hard to get those. So really why do anything else? Um, there's just no reason um, to risk it on a non-food grade um, barrel. All right, next I've got uh, Rosalind Martin. At season end, I clean out my rain barrel for the next season. Is it unusual to have a sort of mold or dirt coating on the inside? Is this bad for my plants? Um, so let's see. Um, I mean, the reality for plants is that like, most of that stuff that's going in the soils um, is gonna be pretty natural and something that I don't think that they would be excessively concerned about. Um, you know, take a look and see what you've got in terms of buildup. You know, everyone's rain barrels might have different buildups. So for example, if you put a barrel in a really sunny location, the barrel's getting hotter, you're not using the water, it's sitting there longer, you're gonna have more growth in there. Um, you might get some mold growing in there. Uh, but if you're putting it in a shading area, a shady area, uh, and you're um, you know using the water up pretty quickly, then I don't think you're going to see much of an issue like that. Um, I did not clean my barrels at the end of last season. I just left them where they were at. Um, what I do for winterizing, I didn't talk about winterizing. That would have been a good question. Um, what I do for winterizing is I just disconnect the barrel from the downspout diverter, um, and I you know close the diverter up so the water just keeps going where it would have gone otherwise. And then I open all of the spigots in the bottom so that any water that falls in drains out. And there's just about an inch at the water, uh, of water at the bottom that freeze thaws all winter, doesn't crack the barrel and it's weight that keeps the barrel in place. So I just leave my barrels there, very easy, very convenient. I did not clean them out at the end of the last season and I've not noticed any smells or anything that I've been concerned about with it. So I, I would not be excessively concerned about that. If you are, you know, it doesn't, it's not a hard thing necessarily to clean them out at the start of the season. All right, moving on, I've got Terry Dasso's question. Um, currently have two 50 gallon rain barrels. They seem to fill up really fast. So we haven't been using them effectively. We're just draining them out a lot of the time. How do we remedy that problem? Um, well, I'm glad to hear that you're draining them out a lot of the time, actually. Um, that's, that's nice if you can like after three days or so, um, drain them out like onto your lawn, your lawn's gonna be happy and be greener for doing that. And then that way the barrels can take more water during the next rainstorm. And that's not a bad thing necessarily. Um, in terms of using them up, it's gonna be a question of, do you have anything to use them up on? Uh, my barrels at home, you know, the, the food garden barrels, you know, those ones I'm using up regularly. 
on my, my food garden, but the one of the barrels doesn't get used up as much. And so I just drain it out like that. So you could think about you know, whether you want to plant more plants, um, that's you know, uh, more expensive, but it's a great thing to do. You can convert more lawn space into say like native gardens, or if you're adding shrubs, uh, then that's going to be more stuff to water, at least temporarily. If you've got house plants inside, those are going to constantly need water. Uh, really one of the bigger exterior water users regularly might be just any annual flowers that you might have, especially if you've got them in like hanging pots or something like that, um, or just pots on your porch. Those plants need a lot of water. They dry out pretty heavily in those pots and uh, rainwater is really good for those plants, especially. Um, so just think about whether you can add more plants, more things to use the water. But if you don't have enough, then yeah, just draining it out. You can do what I recommended. I did the double spigot and then a little hose on one that I just left open at a drip. And uh, you can just time it so that it drains in you know, three-ish, four-ish days, something like that. And then that way you don't get stagnant water and it's draining out so you can capture the next storm. All right. Cindy Clardy asked, what is a mosquito dunk? That's a very good question. Uh, so BT, um, Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, it is, uh, I'm not gonna, I, can't, I can't remember what it is exactly. Uh, it is a critter. Uh, that will be the technical term that I will use. I forget if, uh, what kind of microorganism it might be, but it um, attacks and kills uh, insect larvae very effectively. So it's a natural um, additive that you can put into uh, any standing water, um, put it into a rain barrel, people put it into their ponds and such, and it's gonna kill any mosquito larva, but it wears off, I think it's like a week or so that it'll wear off, something like that. And so that's where we recommend against um, relying on mosquito dunks because if you were to use that, you can add it in, it'll kill any mosquitoes that are in there for a week, but then you have to keep adding it all season. So it's better to add a screen on top, that just excludes those mosquitoes so you don't have to worry about it so much. And I will add on the mosquito front, I learned this year. So I had had the spigot here open. It's, oh, yeah, there you go, you can see it on here. I'd had this open, I had a hose coming off of it and it warmed up really early this year. I didn't expect it, but mosquitoes found their way into this open. And so what I ended up doing is putting just a little plastic coating on the end um, of the, the little tube I had coming out. So that way mosquitoes couldn't find their way in there. You know, once it's connected to the downspout diverter, that's gonna be a much harder pathway for mosquitoes to use. Um, but it was a surprise for me this year and one that I've you know, solved at this point. Um, so mosquito dunks are not necessarily the best way to go. They work, yes, but you've got to use them a lot. All right, next, let's see, Mar uh, Marie Donigan, I came late. Um, the barrel will be to the side of the downspout. Can you demonstrate how to get the water into the rain barrel, in that case, a diverter? So Marie, um, I'm gonna say, go to the website uh, link that we shared and you can watch an eight minute video there that shows you how to do that installation. The reality is everyone's gonna be different. Um, but the brief summary is typically for many of the diverters, you either cut the downspout, you drill a hole in, you install the diverter into that, um, and then there's a hose that's gonna go into the rain barrel. And uh, most of those systems work with the uh, existing access points on these rain barrels uh, that Friends of the Rouge is making available. Some of them though, um, you have to drill a, a separate hole. It's just gonna depend on the system. The Fiskar is one I had. I had to drill a new hole uh, to make it work. But the uh, earth-minded one, you don't have to. And the uh, upcycled um, diverters that we have on the Friends of the Rouge website, you don't need to drill a new hole for those either. All right, let's see next. Can plastic rain barrels be stored outside over the winter if empty? I actually answered that question, uh, <laughs> answering a different question a second ago. So the answer is yes. Um, and I won't go into it again um, since I already answered it before. But yes, it's quite possible just to store them outside. You don't even need to turn them over. Some people do that, but then they're gonna like blow over and such. Um, and then the barrels can get damaged sometimes. So keeping them upright and just disconnecting them from the diverter and opening up all of the faucets, all the spigots um, so that they drain out. That's worked for me for two seasons now and I haven't had an issue with cracking. Next, we've got Andy Woodrick. What is the low cost source to find containers suitable for upcycling into rain barrels? So I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, I have seen folks um, posting to different Facebook groups about some of the sources that they found uh, for like $10 barrels. Um, some folks will access uh, like soda, soda barrels um, from some of the soda manufacturers in the area. Um, so that's a possibility. Um, we found it really, really hard to get barrels from those sources though. Maybe you'll have better luck. Maybe you know somebody that works at one of those factories. Um, but look around. I would recommend though, uh, per question earlier, making sure that it's food grade. And if you're gonna do it yourself, then um, really make sure you're doing the mosquito exclusion 
Um, it's oftentimes the DIY barrels where people aren't thinking or planning for mosquitoes where we hear about nuisance issues. Um, I've heard of folks that actually just go and buy a trash can um, from a store and slap a diverter in it and slash a, a slap a hose bib on the bottom and they just keep the lid on so there's no opening even that they need to install any kind of excluder on. So that can work also. So there's a lot of different kinds of containers you could potentially convert over. Right, Mary Lynn Stapula asked, what do I do with the rain barrels at the end of the season? I think we've already answered that. Uh, Lucy Klinkhammer, can you address winterization of rain barrel disconnect and store? We've answered that as well. We're good to go. Um, Kristen Barlow asks, what was the door prize? It will be an upcycled rain barrel. And if you go and take that um, uh, evaluation for this workshop, at the very end of the evaluation, you'll see a link to where you can enter in for the door prize drawing. All right. Sean Marks, what size is the overflow outlet? What are the options for diverting water from the overflow to gardens or other areas? So that is a good question. That's gonna be maybe a little advanced for folks. You're gonna to wanna to be uh, able to think about you know, doing your own like PVC or HDPE pipe cuts and connections. If you wanna think about really constructing your own robust overflow. Uh, the one that comes default, um, I've referred to this as being a place where the, the downspout diverters can connect in. But some folks will actually use these as an overflow. They'll have um, the downspout just empty into the top and then they'll have this as an overflow. I don't really like that. Um, this is, I think it's about a three quarter inch hole here. And so this is kind of smaller than the you know, rate in which the water can come in. So sometimes if you're relying on that as your overflow, the hose attached to it, taking it away, if you get a really intense rainstorm, it can still sometimes overflow from the top. So um, that's why I like the diverters because um, the water's gonna come in here. When this gets full, the water just goes back to the downspout, back where it would have gone. And then it's much easier to manage down there. So you could do um, you know, an HDPE um, pipe system um, and, pipe it underground like a pop of emitter farther away from your home. That's really, I think, about the most robust way to be managing the overflow away from a rain barrel. But you know, if you want to just do that where the water just comes in the top and then you've got an overflow here, you could put in a larger pipe. You could drill out um, you know, a two or a three inch uh, diameter hole here and add a larger PVC pipe system and pipe it away to wherever it would make sense for you. So that's an option and people definitely do that. I've seen many examples um, of people doing it that way. The other thing I don't like about that is if you're cutting your downspout so it comes into here, then at the end of the season when you're going to winterize, what do you do at that point? Uh, you want to really disconnect the rainwater so it's not going in here anymore. But now that you've cut your downspout, it's hard to reconnect the downspout at that point. So I'm a big fan of the diverters as being just the simplest, easiest way to be doing all of this. Um, there's extra costs from those, like 30 to 40 bucks. So that cost might be prohibitive for some folks, uh, but that's really the most robust way to be doing it. Okay, answered Sean's question. Um, Mary Kennedy, are all the rain barrels on your site food grade? The answer to that is yes. And in fact, the typical use for all these rain barrels was in transporting food internationally. So uh, oftentimes olives and olive oil uh, were used uh, in these rain barrels previously. They're all HDPE food grade plastic. All right, let's see. Aaron Schwartz, not a question, just a comment. My city Oak Park now provides discounts on our water bill for diverting water from the combined sewerage system. Others may wanna check with their cities if they're considering barrels. That's a great comment, Aaron. The reality is that most communities in the future are gonna be doing this. So even if yours is not yet, most communities are gonna to try to start something called a stormwater utility where they charge you for your contribution to the stormwater problem. So the more uh, hard surfaces you have, whether it's roofs or driveways, um, the more you get charged. Um, and that's a great thing to do because it's a fair system, right? People that have a lot of hard surface, they have to pay more because it costs the city a lot to manage the water basically. And so it's a way for the, the costs to be fairly uh, distributed across the community. But then the great thing is if you're doing good things, if you're doing rain barrels, you're doing rain gardens, then you can get discounts because you're doing your part to stop the water problems. Um, so and I've lost the question now. Um, so let's see. So he said Oak Park is doing it. Um, I think Royal Oak is doing it. Ann Arbor is doing it. Um, Detroit, I haven't looked recently at Detroit's. Um, Detroit's got a fair number of options for residences, but I'm not sure whether or not they're giving credits right now for rain barrels. Uh, and then again, the reality is pretty much every community wants to do this and will likely do it sometime in the next five years or so. All right, 
continue working through questions. Janine Jeffrey, my buildup is from I-96, and so I get gunk that is tire oil dust. I clean out and store in the garage. That is that is a lot of gunk. That might be a reason, right? I said every rain barrel is different uh, depending on the context. And uh, yeah, if you're getting a bunch of uh, aerosols, particulate matter that's flying up from a freeway nearby, it's going to be a lot more gunk. And so yeah, I could see, especially in that situation, that it makes a lot of sense just to clean it out. If you store it in the garage, that way it's not going to be picking up gunk all winter time, especially. You know, during the growing season, you might have more plants uh, as a buffer against that particulate matter pollution. Uh, but in the winter time, when leaves are dropping, not so much. Uh, I would recommend trying to plant, uh, if you can, an evergreen buffer um, between your house and the freeway. That's going to reduce some of that pollution coming in. Next, Kristen Barlow, is there a law in Michigan about catching rainwater? Nope, there is not a law in Michigan. Um, I said at the start that it's legal everywhere in Michigan that I'm aware of, and I've checked with a lot of municipalities in the Rouge. Every time I hear somebody say, well, I heard it was illegal, I check, and no one uh, is nowhere illegal in Michigan. You do need to watch out for nuisance laws. Um, there are laws against uh, supporting pests, mosquitoes and such, but as long as you're excluding mosquitoes, that shouldn't be an issue. Only place in the country that I'm aware of where there has ever been a law about catching rainwater was Colorado, um, and they actually changed that law a couple of years ago. So even Colorado now, you can catch rainwater. There is no concern that I'm aware of um, that would prevent you from catching rainwater at your home. All right, let's see. Uh, let's, Lana Benker asks, can these be used without a gutter system on the house? That is difficult, right? Because if you don't have a gutter, then you just have whatever the small patch of roof is, that's gonna fall into this here, uh, this rain barrel. And you could do that. You could put the rain barrel under whatever that structure and roof that you can try to capture, but it's probably not gonna fill up very much. So really gutters are, are the best way to do rain barrel systems. Any kind of rainwater catchment gutters help immensely. I have seen some folks try to get um, creative with like giant funnels that extend off from their rain barrels. And you can do it this way so you can see a little bit better that capture a bigger footprint of just direct rainfall so that can be a way if you're like at a community garden or something like that, there's no building, there's no gutter that you can capture some water to use. Um, and you know, the nice thing about those kinds of systems is sometimes it's hard to get water out to those gardens. Uh, and so a rain barrel can be a way to have an available supply, but it's hard to get enough water in fundamentally. Uh, a gutter next to a roof is really about the best way to do it. Um, let's see, Jennifer Williams asks, can this be rewatched someplace? We are recording, it will be available on our Facebook and YouTube page. Sean Marks, what diverter, diverters do you like and why? So I have only tried two different kinds at my house now. And really, it's hard to have an opinion about the diverters without having tested them yourself um, over a period of time. And so I've used both of the earth-minded and the, the Fiskars diverters at my house. Both have worked well. The Fiskars has an issue that the internet will tell you about. We have to do some extra caulking to make it work. But um, if you're comfortable using caulk, that was not hard to do at all. And then with that, the Fiskars have been great. Um, earth-minded has been great. I haven't seen any issues with either of those. Um, that video that's on our rain barrel page that steps you through 10 different diverter types, highly recommend you take a look at that because it's going to show you a just 10 different types that are out there that will help you to imagine, you know, where do you want to put it? What's the situation like? Um, which of those diverters is likely to work best for you? Um, so that's what I would recommend for you. We have an upcycled uh, diverter on our website, but I have actually not used it. I opted not to use it at my house because of the white color on it. Uh, as you might have might recall seeing, uh, we've got a pretty medium gray uh, color on the house itself. I picked black rain barrels so that I could get a range of color um, at my house. It's nice to have that really dark color value. And then I've got lighter plants that are gonna be around it. So I'm gonna see some nice color contrast. I didn't wanna have white next to um, all of those um, darker gray things. That was gonna be a little too much contrast. I didn't wanna bring people's attention to the diverter. Um, and so I ended up going with black colored diverters. I could have painted the upcycle uh, diverter, but I didn't do that. Um, so, so those are the only ones that I have much experience with. And that's why I like that video because it kind of steps you through some of the pros and cons. Uh, maybe in the next year or two, I'll find funding to uh, give me the time to start experimenting with uh, more of these diverters, but uh, we haven't done that yet. Um, what size is the overflow is Sean's next question. And I think I answered that before. This is, I think it's a three quarter inch um, overflow here. And so if you're gonna rely on this as an overflow though, you're really gonna wanna have a bigger overflow. Um, the diverters are gonna be a much better system for overflow than that. All right, what else do we have? 
Um, Elizabeth Morella, will hardware stores have kits to adjust the drainage spouts to work with the rain barrels? So it's really going to depend on the kit. Um, some of the kits are actually going to come with the hole saw. It just provides it to you because the hole saw is really cheap. And that way you don't have to go to the hardware store. Uh, so some kits will just give you what you need with that. Um, the earth mining kit was like that. It gave me a one inch hole saw um, that I could use. The Fiskars kit did not give me the tools that I needed. I needed to have a hacksaw to cut through the um, diverter itself so that I could insert the, uh, I'm sorry, cut through the downspout so that I could insert the diverter into it. So you had to have a, a hacksaw for it, five bucks from any hardware store, easy to find that. Um, so the reality is that any tools you might need are readily available. They might already be supplied and there are typically good instructions to help you to install those downspouts. All right, Let's see, we've got Janine Jeffrey. I use a trash can with a mosquito screen. Janine, I think I was thinking of you. I remembered your comment uh, about a, a trash can with a mosquito screen when I mentioned that earlier as an option. There are all kinds of ways to do it yourself. Um, and if you're doing it yourself, you just really wanna be careful about those mosquitoes. Oh, I just saw an Aaron's question that I lost earlier. Um, Let's see, we've got Tina Seabar just joined. How long can water sit in a barrel before you should just drain it? I have not seen research on that or anyone sharing their experiences, right? <laughs> the worst case scenario, of, you know, you've got your rain barrel and you just sit on it for a month or two or something like that um, and let it get stagnant. So that's not something you wanna do. Um, I don't recommend anyone experiment with that. Uh, you really wanna get the water to drain out. Um, and so, especially if it's in a sunny location, um, one of my barrels is on the south side of my house. It does get protection from a dogwood shrub that's right next to it. So that helps reduce the sun on it. Uh, other consideration with that, um, black barrels are gonna heat up a little more. That dark color is gonna absorb more solar energy, more heat and heat up more. The hotter it's getting, probably the less time you're gonna wanna have the water sitting in that barrel. And so that's gonna be where it's gonna be more important to do something like the technique I mentioned, where you um, have one of your spigots on the barrel open a little bit to a drip so that it drains in three to four days. And I'll, I'll mention at this point, uh, the way in which I timed that, I did a, a rough estimate of just open it up a little bit and see how long it takes to fill up a cup uh, of water. And then I just did a little bit of math there to see uh, you know, how long it would then take for the 50 gallons to drain out. That gave me an idea there. And I, I could give you that number, but I don't remember what it was right now. I, I think it was like a minute maybe to fill up a half a cup or a three quarters cup or something like that. And that translated to about three to four days draining. Uh, but you can also just experiment with it. It's fun to get out there and just, ah, let's see if I open it up this far, how long does it take to drain? Uh, your first year with the rain barrel, you're going to accidentally forget to close the spigot and it's going to drain out. You're going to miss a storm here and there. It, it's going to be fun as you uh, try to figure out how to best make it fit within your routines. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, Marie Donegan, I came late. The barrel with the sign. Oh, I already answered that one. I just didn't check it. So that one's Cindy Clardy. I'm older and use soaker hoses a lot, so I don't have to stand long periods to water my flower beds. Soaker hoses are not recommended for rain barrels. Is there some other passive watering system for rain barrels? So that's going to be a situation where rain barrels are going to be a little tough for you. Um, one thing that I've seen people do sometimes, um, and this, this wouldn't necessarily work for a broad area, but it would work if you've got like a tree or shrub or something like that. Some people will take a five gallon bucket, drill a hole on the underside, I think like an eighth inch hole, something small, so that water slowly drains out of that barrel. So you could have a few of those in places and then um, you know, dump water from a five gallon bucket into it, something like that. The reality with rain barrels though, is it's a slow technology. Um, so it's the kind of technology that encourages you to get outside and just enjoy a beautiful day in your garden. Uh, I should say a beautiful half an hour in your garden. Uh, doesn't take that long necessarily to water your plants. Last year, I, I went with the extreme during the pandemic and I planted like, I don't know, like 500,000 square feet of plants, something like that, 30 shrubs. I was out there for like an hour, um, twice a week uh, initially. Um, each time to get all those plants watered. So it took me a little bit of time, but it was, again, it was beautiful. It was pleasant to be in the garden. Um, I got to really see how the plants were doing um, and to think about future gardening. So I used the time wisely while I was out there, um, but it is a little bit slower. And so if your body is not gonna let you be out there for half an hour with a hose, um, you know, watering, then maybe that's not gonna be the way to go. If you're doing something like a rain garden though, something where there's a basin, what you could do is uh, just have uh, an attachment on the end of the, um, the hose 
like a soaker attachment and just you know put it in the area and just turn it on and leave it. So that way the water is just going to kind of fill up that rain garden area, or maybe it's going to fill up that stretch of your lawn or something like that. So you just you know turn it on and walk away basically. So that might be the the right thing for you. It's going to be thinking about watering different things. Maybe you're not going to be watering a huge area, spot watering each thing. Maybe instead you're going to use that rainwater to water your house plants indoor because that's the the same kind of rate. Um, maybe you're going to be using that rainwater with um, not a soaker hose but a soaker attachment where you just put it in the area lawn that you want, open it up and just leave it for a bit. Maybe you, you only open it up halfway, leave it there for like five, 10 minutes, and then you just move it around every now and then. It's going to be you know, figuring out different ways to make it work with your life um, and with uh, you know, the time you've got available and what your body will let you do. Um, but uh, I, I do hear about some people will actually install pressurization systems on rain barrels, um, but that's not typically done here in Michigan just because these barrels are so small and uh, water is pretty cheap here in Michigan. Um, that kind of thing is typically done in places more like desert climates, Australia. I'm from Tucson, Arizona originally. Um, out in Tucson, my parents have a thousand gallon rain tanks. Um, they didn't install a pressurization system on it, but when people are talking about doing thousand gallon tanks, then it starts to make a little more sense to do a pressurization system. Here in Michigan, though, it just doesn't necessarily make sense. It adds a lot of cost on, and since these are just 55 gallons, it wouldn't necessarily make sense. If you chained like five of these together, then you'd have a 250 gallon tank system. Maybe it would start to make sense to put some kind of pressurization system in at that point so that you can water a little bit more. Uh, so it's something that is done. Uh, there are lots of different pumps. Uh, pump systems that are out there that you could explore, um, there'd be ways to do that. All right, that was the last of the questions here in the chat on the um, Zoom. At this point, I'm gonna see if there are any other questions out there in Facebook land. If I can break out of the presentation here, let's see. Um, there we go. Let's get to Facebook land and see if there's any questions on the live there. Uh, otherwise, it's 1245 or probably close to the end. Let's go to our Friends of the Roofs Facebook page. Let's see if I can find this live. And oh, and I hope this doesn't create some kind of infinite loop for those of you watching in Facebook to see me on Facebook while I'm talking to you. That would be terrible. Looks like no comments on the Facebook. So easy enough. Well, with that, unless anyone has any last minute questions, pause for another minute here to see if any other questions come through. Um, but I think we'll start to wrap it up. Um, I will bring us back to the link with the door prize page. Um, the rouge.org slash eval is going to be the place you want to go um, to fill out the workshop evaluation at the end here. At the end of that evaluation, it's a two page evaluation. Uh, most of it's just, you know, one to five, one to five, pretty fast. There's going to be a link to where you can put your name in the hat for that door prize drawing for an upcycled rain barrel color of your choice in one of our pickup events this year. Uh, Drika de Graff asks, how close are you to the 6,000 rain barrel goal? That's a great question. And the reality is we have no idea, but that's a problem that I'm working to solve and expect to have solved this year. Um, last year, we sold about 300 and 400 or so rain barrels. Um, so at least that far. Uh, and then 10, 20 years of people doing rain barrels all over the place. But it's really hard for us to know what's happening where. So this year, we're planning on launching um, dynamic map system where you can just see, you can go and report if you've got a rain barrel or not, and they'll be able to see all of the rain barrels that people have reported and we'll have good privacy safeguards on there as well. Um, so that is uh, something we'll hopefully know the answer to by the end of this year to see what our progress is. We'll have a progress thermometer so you can see, you know, year by year how close we're getting. And uh, we're working to have that map also connect in with some of our adjacent watersheds, our sister watersheds, Huron and Clinton. So we'll try to compete with them a little bit so you can get the most rain barrels. Uh, so a lot of exciting stuff uh, coming up over the course of this year as we work towards that 6,000 rain barrel goal. So got that one. Janine Jeffrey uh, made a comment. She's apparently done the workshop um, evaluation. There's a code at the end of that evaluation um, that you need to plug into the um, uh, door prize registration. That's our, our, you know, trying to make sure you do the evaluation. Uh, and maybe it's silly. So you can give me some feedback if that's a silly thing to do. Uh, Lena, thank you for saving our water systems. You are so welcome, Lena. We can't do it without you, though. Friends of the Rouge is... Uh, trying to help communities uh, be the change to make the change. It's really going to be when the 6,000 folks 
uh, do rain barrels. We've got a thousand rain garden goal by the end of 2025. So it's really when uh, the 1.3 million residents of the Rouge um, start taking concrete actions at their homes, that's going to be where we see our clean water future come into place. So certainly thank you for thanking us, but thanks to you all as well for being here today. And I see Patty is asking, I see the Earth Day event. Where can we sign up for that? The website there we go, rain gardens, the rouge.org slash RG101. There's going to be a button on there that should take you to the registration link. If I didn't goof something up, um, you should be able to register on there for that, um, that event. All right. Let's see, since we got more questions, I'll pause a little longer. I am, I am with you all until the questions stop or one o'clock, whichever one comes first. Um, Mary Harper, I missed the code. How do I get back? Maybe the code is a silly thing. Um, you can go take the workshop evaluation again, but who really wants to do that? Um, I think the code was something like, uh, I don't know, put something in there. I, I'm really ready for the rain. Janine Jeffrey put the code in for me there, which I'm giving it away here. This is all feedback for me that maybe the code is just a silly thing and I just really shouldn't worry about trying to make sure people do the workshop evaluation. We're all here for fun. Uh, ready for the rain is the code for that. And uh, I'm gonna be the one that's gonna be looking at those entries. And so if you get close, that's good enough. I don't, I don't really care at the end of the day. Uh, maybe I'll get in trouble for saying that, but I don't. Um, so, all right, pause in a little more. Any more questions coming in? I've got 31 questions answered so far. I see there's still 33 participants here. I wonder, I'm gonna go back to just my home setup here. I wonder if there's anything else I can share with folks on here. Um, I'll share some of my visions here uh, and I've got the Q&A open. So the second somebody asks me a question, I will shut up about what's happening at my house and uh, uh, answer your question. But um, I just got a rain chain delivered to my house. Um, so I'm actually gonna have a rain chain that comes down right about here. And then it's gonna go into a catchment that's gonna flow into this rain garden right here. And then I've got the gutter balanced such that there's something of a split, a bit of a high point right here. So this small section of roof is really gonna be about enough to fill up that rain barrel right there. And then most of the section of roof is gonna go into this rain garden right here. Um, so that's, that's a little bit more uh, just enriching details I can maybe share with you here. Um, Barbara Cope asks, what did you plant to absorb more water in your yard? So really what I did was I dug rain gardens. So these rain gardens right here are about actually four to five inches deep across, and then it's backfilled with about three to four inches of mulch. So it doesn't actually look that deep, but this is going to be a big water storage area right here. that's going to soak up a lot of water. I actually have a sump pump outlet that's right over here too. And so my front lawn would typically be underwater for a while as well during the season. Um, that sump pump outlet goes into a um, dry well. So the dry well is going to get most of the sump pump water. And then this rain garden is going to get the, uh, much of the roof water that's running off in this area. And then you can't see it, but I've got another rain garden just a little bit farther over here that's also going to help capture some of that driveway water and the overflow from the rain barrel over here. And then I will go back. Here's that aerial um, of my backyard area. And so over here, these are also rain gardens right in the middle of that here. We'll flash back to here is that uh, really exciting thing to wake up for. I will say, actually, uh, my house was fine. This water is more than 10 feet from my house. I've got a sump pump. So there really wasn't a threat to my property uh, from this. And if you have two and five-year-olds, as it turns out, uh, lakes like this are really one of their favorite things to play in. So I actually feel a little bad about trying to solve the water problem because my daughters are probably not going to be particularly thrilled with me if they don't get to splash in, uh, in this lake. Um, this spring, but, um, but I did it. Uh, and here you go. Um, the reality is that my water soaked in fast enough here, um, that lake would typically drain within 48 hours. Um, two days later, that lake would be gone. That's the, the typical rain garden goal. It would be to have the water drain in two days. I've got a bunch of good rain garden plants in the bottom here, things like iris, um, virginica, I've got some sedges, which are like grasses, um, but do really, really well in wet environments. Um, so I've got a lot of brown fox sedge. I've got some hibiscus. I've got some cardinal flower in here um, on the edges, which are a little bit drier over here. Um, I've got some more dry loving plants. I've got some grasses. I think I've got some little blue stem around the edges. I've got some um, golden, no, I don't have golden rod. I've got uh, black eyed Susans. I've got some echinacea, some cone flower. I've got swamp milkweed in the bottom. I've got um, sylphium, um, 
Silphium Prairie Dock. There we go. I've got some Prairie Dock in there. In the back area, I've got a bunch of um, beautiful um, Indian grass. I'm going to get a great grass, a tall grass screen that's growing back over here. Um, so that's a little bit of an orientation to those rain gardens. Uh, let's see. Yi Ching Chen says, I read that lighter colored barrels help reduce the growth of algae going along with what you said earlier about dark barrels. Heat up more. Does that mean that in general, light colored barrel is better in preventing growth of mold, algae, and other organic matters? So I think, I think generally, yes, light is a little bit better. But the reality is that I, certainly of the barrels that um, we're bringing in through Upcycle with Friends of the Rouge, most of the barrels are fairly dark in their value. Uh, and so the, the difference between the black one and which one would I say that's the lightest? Let me go back to one of the pictures of the barrels. Which one of these would you say is the lightest? Right, so there's a squint method they taught me in uh, landscape architecture school where it kind of hides the color value and you kind of see the darkness value a little bit more. I'm gonna say maybe the green one there is maybe the lightest value. Um, but the reality is that they're all like medium tone, dark tone on the, the black one. So they're all, if they're just left in full sun, gonna pick up some heat. Um, and so I think that really the best thing to, to try to do is if you've got a, a shrub that you can um, put it behind so that there's some shading, that's going to make a huge difference. That's going to make more of a difference than the color. Uh, and then if you can also just try to make sure that you're draining the barrel within three days, um, which would be a, a good goal anyways for water quality, then you just really don't have to worry so much about the temperature. And like I said, I, I did not see any real algae um, in my barrels last year, no nuisances, nothing that I was concerned about um, or over the last um, two years that I've had barrels. So, um, so yes, getting lighter colored barrels can help, but um, I had black barrels and I didn't really see an issue. So I wouldn't be too worried about it. Let's see, what time is it now? I don't even know, oh, we got another one in. Would you post photos of your yard and rain gardens on the website, Facebook, the spring and summer, when plants are in bloom so we can see the results of your work. I, um, that's a good idea. Uh, I will try to do that. I am going to be planting rain gardens at Park this year. We've got uh, Park is our office, Plymouth Arts and Recreation Complex. Uh, we are doing 20,000 square feet of rain gardens right now, and I'm doing the planting designs for that. I finished 4,000 square feet of planting designs out of that. So I'm going to be very busy over the next four months uh, finishing the designs and getting those gardens planted. So I will, I will try to snap some pictures. The reality has been I have been too busy with work to actually do that, but it's part of my plan. Uh, I've been trying to, to capture some pictures. I'll do my best to share some of that um, when they are growing in. Um, so yeah, do my best on that, Elizabeth. Thank you. That's very kind of you to ask. All right, and I still can't see the time. My screen is blocking it. Let's see if I break out of this. Come on, 12.57. All right, three more minutes. I'll wait another minute again here, see if you all can keep me here a little longer. This is clearly, I hope you're getting the idea, and probably my favorite thing in the world to talk about. So I'm honored that you all have stayed around this long with me and have had such great questions. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to share the experiences that I've had here with Rain Barrels in Michigan and uh, also relying on all of the, um, didn't mention this, but I probably built like 20 cisterns, uh, like minimum like four or 500 gallon cisterns in Arizona before I left. So um, the reality is uh, there's a lot of places in the world where this is normal and everyone's doing it. And uh, that's going to be our goal here for Southeast Michigan for the long term is uh, this is a simple fun thing to do and uh, will lead to great things, I think, for you and for your home and for the Rouge, Rouge community. So Beth, you're very, very welcome. Thank you for joining. And I think with that, I think we're going to wrap it up here. So I will again um, post this, uh, the video recording uh, to Facebook, to YouTube, so you can catch it later on. And uh, again, the uh, evaluation link, the rouge.org slash eval, we'll flash it one more time here. Um, you can catch me for Rain Gardens 101 coming up uh, on Earth Day uh, later in uh, later in April. Um, and once you do that evaluation, you'll get a link where you can enter yourself in for the door prize drawing. And uh, I put a silly code in there, uh, so make sure you don't forget about the code. But um, you can just also write in there, I forgot to grab the code. I don't care. I'm going to probably take that out of future things. Uh, we're all about um, trust and goodwill here at the Rouge, and uh, I think it's kind of a silly thing to put that in there. All right, with that, I'm going to wrap it up, stop the share. Back to Stubby. Stubby wishes you all a wonderful day, a happy spring, and we will catch you next time.